Welcome to Club E. Hi, I'm Rick Brimacombe of Brimacombe and Associates. I am your architect of business growth and will work with you to unlock your potential and amplify the scale of your company. Today, we're talking about the best investment you will ever make. I want to thank our sponsors, Irish Titan, an e-commerce and web development firm, Island Bank, a locally owned community bank, Romaine Berg, a digital marketing agency, Schwegman, Lumberg, Woosner, an intellectual property law firm, and Voyager U, a community to build your independent work life. Participate in today's session. If you are in YouTube, you can add your questions to the comments field. We will try to weave those into the best of our abilities. Also, while you're there, please hit the subscribe and hopefully the like button. That will allow us to let you know when we are going live. You can also catch Clubby on your favorite podcast platform. So whether you listen in Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, or others, you can catch our Clubby sessions there as well. And then I guess last but not least, you can hit the clubby.com website and see all the past videos. All right, with that, I'd like to introduce today's guest, Neil Littman is founder, CEO, and general partner at BioVerge. Welcome, Neil. Thank you, Rick. Great to be here today. And Neil's contact information, again, if you're on YouTube, is in the comments field. But those of you who are not uh, listening and watching us today, it's neil at bioverge.com, neil at bioverge.com. All right, Neil, let's uh, start out with uh, you telling us a little bit about your background, your, yourself, the, the firm, and the various things that you're up to. Sure, I'd be happy to. So a little bit about myself to, to start off with. I'm originally from Baltimore. Um, went to the University of Colorado uh, to do my undergraduate work, uh, studied molecular biology there, worked in a virology lab for a number of years, looking at the oncolytic properties of the Epstein-Barr virus. Um, you know, I guess in high school, I was just always interested in science and in biology, you know, read a couple books of, about sort of virology and, you know, so-called kind of virus hunters that were traveling the world looking at these obscure viruses like Ebola. Um, and so, you know, my decision to go out to Colorado was, you know, sort of wanted to change the pace from the East Coast to experience something different. Uh, CU had a, had a couple different virology labs, uh, so I could sort of, you know, take my pick of, of what I wanted to, to study there. Um, you know, graduated from, from Boulder, decided that, uh, you know, medical research lab work was not really my calling in life. So decided to move back to Baltimore, uh, pursued a master's degree in biotechnology from Johns Hopkins. Uh, which for me was, was really great and I think opened my eyes to the world of uh, what I would call the business of biotech. So, you know, I never really understood too well as an undergraduate that there, there was a whole world out there where you could be around science, you could continue learning about science, but you didn't actually have to be in the lab doing science or you didn't necessarily have to pursue a career in medicine. And so I took a, a bunch of really interesting courses around the finance of uh, biotechnology, for example, uh, intellectual property course. I was like, wow, okay, there's this whole other world that I never knew about. Um, so from, from uh, my, my Hopkins days, I, I decided to sort of pursue the, the, the business aspect of things. And so I uh, took a job on Wall Street uh, at Deutsche Bank uh, in healthcare investment banking. So I spent a, a number of years uh, you know, advising emerging growth biotech companies on things like IPOs, private and public financing. Uh, so the Deutsche Bank for a couple of years, Times Wise Old Partners for a few years. Uh, before making my way out to the West Coast uh, about 12 years ago, uh, pivoted a little bit and uh, joined a, what I can only describe as a, a pretty unique and wonderful place called the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. That's a mouthful, so we refer to it as CIRM for short. Uh, at the time, CIRM had $3 billion of funding to invest in and advance um, stem cell and regenerative medicine technologies. So I joined uh, as director of business development. I was part of the executive leadership team that came up with a strategy about how to deploy that capital. It was really at CERN that I started working with technology transfer offices at places like Stanford and UCSF and UCLA as they were spinning out IP. I did a lot of work with venture capitalists as they were looking to, to finance uh, the, the, the companies and the technology being spun out of those uh, universities. And it was, it was then that I really started sort of getting, I guess, getting the bug or getting the itch to, um, you know, invest myself. Um, I, you know, I kind of took a page from, from Charlie Munger and, and Warren Buffett, uh, you know, value investing and say, you know, invest in what you know. I sort of knew healthcare. I, I was around the ecosystem of, of company formation. So I actually started investing uh, as an angel investor in some early stage companies, started advising uh, some private companies during that time. 
Um, and so that was sort of the, the birth of what, ha what has since become uh, Bioverge. Um, and and you know, Bioverge's is mission is to democratize access to early stage you know, healthcare venture capital. Uh, it really started as a way to solve my own problem because I wanted to diversify my own portfolio away from the public markets. Um, and there, you know, there, there was actually an inspiring story from my days at CIRM. Um, I got to know a little girl by the name of Evie. Uh, Evie uh, and her parents would come to board meetings at CIRM. They would talk about Evie's experience being treated with one of the therapies that we funded at CIRM. So Evie was born with severe combined immunodeficiency or SCID, uh, commonly known as bubble baby disease. So children born with SCID don't have a functioning immune system. They uh, frequently are in and out of the hospital with severe infections, uh, typically have a life expectancy of 20 to 25 years. Uh, so some funded work at UCLA, out of Donald Cohn's lab, uh, was a lentiviral gene therapy uh, that, that treated Evie when she was about one years old uh, and, and literally cured her of her disease. So when I met her at CERM, she was about six or seven years old and lived a normal life. She went to school. She had a dog. She liked to surf. I mean, all things that would have been previously impossible for Evie or any child born with skin. And so I was like, wow, this is really incredible. This is like science fiction, but this is actually happening today. Why don't more people know about this? So I would go and I would talk to my friends, my family, whoever would listen and tell this amazing story about Evie and this technology that we funded at CERM. And like, why don't more people know about this? Um, and why can't more people invest in this stuff? And so, you know, that, that was really the genesis for, for Bioverse is, is, you know, health is universal, it affects us all. And so, you know, I really have constructed Bioverse to allow more people to invest in, in early stage healthcare technologies for, you know, number one, uh, health is universal, affects us all. So by definition, investing in healthcare is impact investing. And number two, you know, it can be a great, a great way to diversify your portfolio and, and potentially enhance your returns. Um, so, you know, fast forward today, we've been operating Bioverge for, for about five years now. So um, when you started Bioverge, is there a good story of, you know, you got a napkin out, you're at a restaurant or bar and started sketching out ideas or what's the story behind you starting Bioverge? Yeah, so uh, there, there are a lot of napkins that I think have since been thrown away or sort of sketching out the, the idea. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I talked a little bit about the inspiration, but sort of, sort of going from inspiration to execution, I think, is, is you know, the devil's in the details. And so, you know, I initially wrote, wrote a business plan, uh, did sort of the, the lean startup model and sort of, you know, whiteboarding and looking at, you know, customer segments and, you know, trying to figure out, you know, is there an actual business here, uh, you know, tr trying to democratize and allow more people to invest in, you know, private investments, uh, was relatively novel at that time. So there's a lot of, you know, legalities, a lot of compliance related issues. So it took me a long time to, to sort of work out some of the, the legal and compliance related issues about, you know, who and how can we market these deals? They all had to be marketed privately at those times. Uh, you know, how do we, you know, how, how do we ensure that only accredited investors that we have a relationship with have, uh, you know, access to these types of deals? So, yeah, I mean, I think there, there was a lot of challenges in the beginning getting sort of the infrastructure stood up, but the vision, I think, has always been the same. And the, the, the vision still stands, right? We, we really want to bring science fiction to life. And so, you know, I, it's funny, I, I, I did sort of go back and look at my original business plan. Uh, it was a couple months ago at this point, and it, it had a terrible name at that, th that time. I think I called it like Salus Health Funder. Salus is some like obscure Roman god of like health and well-being or something. So you know, glad, <laughs> glad I didn't stick with that name. But if I, if I look at sort of the core themes, a lot of the details have changed, but the trajectory of what we're doing still, I think, very much remains intact. Um, so it's, it's, it's been actually interesting to see sort of where, where I envision things going versus, you know, where we are today. And how about the name BioVerge? How'd you come up with that after you ditched the uh, Roman God? Yeah, uh, names are incredibly hard to come up with. So, uh, you know, the, the name of BioVerge uh, really has two parts. The bio part is probably easier to explain, right? That's obvious, you know, biology, you know, healthcare. Um, the verge part is a little more nuanced. And so the, the, our investment thesis at Bioverge is really focused around this idea of the convergence of biology and technology. Uh, and so what we're seeing in the market today is that there are a lot of companies that are applying you know, various stacks of technology to solve fundamental problems in biology, in healthcare, everywhere from the lab bench to the bedside of the patient. And so the notion of Bioverge really emphasizes our focus on this idea of the convergence of these disciplines, which is relatively new. 
I'd say. And so we, we are seeing a lot of themes out there. Um, really, there's a secular trend in terms of like this, this idea of the combination of health and tech. Um, and so like, well, what does that mean? Well, well, to us, that means there are a lot of improvements uh, in infrastructure out there that are allowing biotech, allowing healthcare companies to race toward achieving early proof of concept faster and cheaper than ever before. And so I, I sort of look at it, it's akin to kind of like the web 1.0 versus web 2.0, right? We're sort of in the web 2.0 of, of biology these days. And there's lots of uh, different, you know, technology stacks that are being applied to help solve, you know, fundamental challenges in, in healthcare, you know, gone all their days where, you know, a, a company needed to necessarily have wet lab space and have scientists in there with a pipette, you know, pipetting different experiments. A lot of this is now being outsourced to various CROs. Some of the work can be done in the cloud, you know, automation, robotic systems are now regularly involved in the lab. So you can do things in a much higher throughput fashion. All right, so if you look at, again, kind of the, the, the difference in infrastructure, it's almost like, you know, web van versus Instacart, right? What are the differences between, between the two? Well, it's really the software infrastructure that has allowed, you know, Instacart to scale 100x more than what web van ever could have could have done. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that type of technology being applied to healthcare. And so that's really our investment thesis. Uh, that's where the name came from uh, at, at Bioverge. We're seeing a, a, you know, a tremendous number of companies that are now being formed and, and started and you know, need several hundred thousand dollars, maybe single digit millions to get started and race toward you know, early stage proof of concept. You know, 10 years ago, you know, would have been cost tens of millions of dollars to, to get a biotech company stood up. Um, so we're seeing a lot of innovations that we're pretty excited about. And, and so I think our, our name implies really what our thesis is at, at BioVerge. Sure, so actually what you just touched on there, I think is important. Uh, one of the um, presentations I, I give on venture capital, I talk about basically a deflationary period uh, in that you can do so much more for so much less. And that, uh, in essence, is the investment thesis that you all are following. It, it, it really is. Yeah. I mean, I, and I think that's, it, it, it really um, underpins our entire business model, right? So our business model is, you know, we are aggregating largely individual investors into SPVs. We work with family offices. We work with registered investment advisors and their clients. But the whole idea is to democratize. And so, you know, we're, we're not often participating in rounds that are, you know, $50 million series A. We're participating at the seed stage, pre-seed stage. Companies are raising maybe a, you know, a million to $5 million. But that capital allows these companies to achieve early proof of concept, uh, again, faster and cheaper than what would have been previously uh, possible. And so this actually allows angel investors and individual investors to participate in these rounds of funding, um, you know. 10 years ago, you know, unless you were a super high net worth angel investor, you probably weren't participating in, in healthcare or biotech investments. It just wasn't really feasible. Um, so we've really seen the landscape evolve. And a lot of that is this idea of applying technology to help solve some of these fundamental challenges. Okay, so a reminder to everybody, you can submit your questions into the comments field. If you're on YouTube, we will get to those best as we can. Um, and also, uh, weave your comments into our conversation. Uh, uh, Neil, you mentioned a uh, business model. At BioVerge, you have a very uh, unique business model. Maybe uh, spend a moment to explain to our audience about that. Yeah, sure. So we, I mean, I think in many ways, I like to say we're kind of innovating on what it means to be a venture capital firm. So we, we, we have two different sort of business lines. Uh, one, we do operate like a more traditional, you know, venture firm, uh, and our business model is aligned with that. So we typically charge management fees and carried interest on investments that we make. So, you know, our incentives are largely aligned with those of our investor, investors, right? We're not making much off management fees because we don't have, you know, a huge AUM. So, you know, we're making money off of carry and we only make carry, uh, make cap, you know, make profit off carry if our investors are making money as well. So, you know, we're incentivized to only invest in the highest quality and best deals. So, you know, we are not focused on volume. We are focused on high quality investment opportunities. And I think that's a big differentiator for us as a platform. Uh, the other business model that we utilize is under regulation crowdfunding. Uh, this is a new business for us. Uh, we are actually uh, legally prohibited from charging carry on Reg CF transactions. So we charge transaction fees. Uh, so that's a percentage of capital that we help companies raise under Reg CF offerings. Um, 
again, this is a new business for us. It's one that I'm particularly excited about. Uh, and this helps fulfill, fulfill our mission of truly democratizing access. So just for sort of all the listeners out there, you know, regulation crowdfunding means that uh, companies can raise capital from both accredited and also non-accredited investors. Uh, actually, just this past Monday, there are new rules that went into effect uh, that have raised the amount that companies are able to raise under the Rate CF path pathway. Previously, companies were limited to raising just over a million dollars uh, via Rake CF offerings. That has now been raised to uh, a, a max limit of $5 million. So we see that that's you know, particularly exciting for a number of reasons. I mean, number one is going to attract you know, a much larger variety of companies uh, to Rake CF. It's going to attract uh, you know, probably more mature companies that may have a, a different risk, maybe lower risk profile uh, than some of the companies that we've seen come through in the past. I think for healthcare companies in particular, right, oftentimes a million dollars isn't necessarily enough to hit that proof of concept, but $5 million certainly is. So I think we're going to start seeing that it's a much more viable financing pathway for um, healthcare companies in particular, which is our focus, but a whole variety of companies. And from the investor standpoint, you know, this is going to open up the types of companies that investors have access to as well, which I think is, is obviously critical. So if you think about building a diversified portfolio from the investor standpoint, you now have access to a much larger variety of companies. You can invest in slightly more mature companies. You can invest in companies that are, you know, earlier stage, which is, which is our folks at Bioverse. So you can build a, a more well diversified diversified portfolio, even just by doing and participating in rate CF offerings. So uh, again, th these new rules just came into effect, but I think we're, we're pretty excited to see, uh, to sort of see the future and see the, the types of companies we're going to be working with going forward. So very uh, unique business model. Again, a reminder for everybody out there, you're blending a venture capital fund with a reg uh, crowdfunding platform. You're focused on early stage life sciences. Um, unique and interesting uh, business model. And also you've been doing it now for a while and have had good success. So maybe talk a little bit about um, uh, looking backward, uh, the success and, and what you've been doing now for several years. Yeah, so we, we've now been investing for about five years. So we have a portfolio of 21 companies. Uh, we have um, you know, numerous companies that have raised subsequent rounds of follow-on financing, all at higher valuations at this point. So Across our portfolio, we have a 28% IRR um, over the last several years. Um, you know, we have now four companies in our portfolio that are valued at over $100 million, which is which is you know very exciting for us. So a lot of the companies are ha have garnered you know much larger investment from I would say more traditional you know VCs out there. Um, and so you know as we think about you know our thesis and how we fit into the, the broader ecosystem. You know, we will often identify an investment company ahead of some of the larger, you know, VCs out there. We will often help introduce a company to uh, some of the other VCs in the ecosystem as they're going out to, to raise additional rounds of follow-on financing. Sometimes we invest alongside other VCs as well. We do that in, in just about every round that we participate in uh, as well. You know, we, we have developed what we call the Bioverge Network, which is a robust network of subject matter experts, strategic partners, downstream investors. You know where we really help our portfolio companies overcome whatever challenges they are facing. So you know we we definitely do not subscribe to this spray and pray model. We do not invest and say goodbye, good luck, and and hope for the best. Right? We actually want to help our portfolio companies achieve success. Um, and I can I can I can talk about just a couple uh, examples in our portfolio. Sure. Um, so we made an investment. Actually, our very first investment was in a company by the name of Notable Labs. Um, and so Notable. Uh, has developed a, a high throughput, you know, functional screening platform where they can actually take an individual uh, patient sample, blood sample in this case, um, and have it shipped to their lab in Foster City. They're able to, to, to look at uh, hundreds or in some cases, thousands of different combinations of drugs against an individual patient sample to figure out what drug or what combinations of drugs is most effective for that patient. Uh, in this case, they're dealing with patients with blood cancer. Um, and they do this in a very high throughput, throughput fashion. And so, it's, I mean, this is very much sort of precision-based medicine. Uh, they have a, a sort of a, a robotic technology stack that allows them to do this in a high throughput fashion. You know, they're working with a lot of pharma and biotech companies now. As you can imagine, if you could, if you could predict a priori what patient is going to respond to what drug ahead of time, I mean, that's kind of the holy grail of drug development. 
right? And so there's a lot of interest and, in, in, you know, they have a lot of partnerships with large pharma and biotech companies um, utilizing that technology. So, so that one's, you know, particularly exciting. They were initially funded by uh, uh, Founders Fund. They have um, uh, just closed uh, about $40 million Series B uh, that was led by um, B Capital Group, which is the VC arm of Boston Consulting Group, and a lot of other VCs participated in that round as well. Um, I actually spent some time working at Notable Labs. I was vice president of business development there. Um, so, you know, company and technology, I know, I know pretty well. Uh, another, another technology uh, and company in our portfolio is OnClear Therapies. So OnClear has developed, essentially it's a filtration system for cerebral spinal fluid. Um, and the idea is that they can filter out the toxic proteins that lead to various neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, they are initially targeting patients with ALS. Uh, they are in, uh, they're still in the preclinical stage of development. Um, they have some really compelling data from large animal models. They'll, they'll be likely in you know, first in human clinical trials uh, in uh, probably can't publicly disclose, but in the relatively near future, uh, it's it's sort of akin to dialysis, but for the CSF. So, you know, I think that's a that's a pretty novel hypothesis in terms of you know the, what they're pursuing. Um, we, so we invest in them. Uh, Teal Capital is an investor in in Enclair, for example. Um, we identified them, invest in their seed round. They closed a ten million dollar uh, uh, Series A round as well. Um, so that company's doing doing. Uh, you know, performing great. Um, and then we have invested in a digital health company. It's, it's a company that's actually focused on what I would call a digital therapeutic. So un, unlike a, a, a drug that modifies some sort of, you know, you know, chemistry within your body, a digital therapeutic is targeting modifying, you know, behavioral change. And they're trying to, you know, modify and uh, help individuals make long lasting behavioral change. So this company is uh, Blue Mesa Health. They were targeting uh, the diabetic and pre-diabetic populations. Uh, they had a partnership with Merck KGAA where they rolled this, uh, this platform out uh, worldwide. Uh, and they had some really robust data showing that they could actually help prevent pre-diabetics from becoming full-blown diabetics by making you know, consistent changes in diet, in, uh, in, in you know, um, exercise regimens and things like that. Um, they were acquired by uh, Virgin uh, last year actually. So that was, that was the first exit that we had within our portfolio. But, you know, I just wanted to showcase the types of different technologies that we invest in. And so, you know, we invest in a bunch of different sub verticals within healthcare, which also gives our investors another way to diversify, right? Investing in a company like Blue Mesa is, has a different risk profile than a company like Notable, which is more sort of like a biotech platform play, I, I, I would say. Sure. So you talked about a couple of the individual stories uh, what about um, kind of key investment themes uh, that you're following and looking to participate in? And then I guess the uh, a related question is, uh, it's a national footprint that you're looking at. You're not just looking to invest in the West Coast, correct? No, that's the, I'll tackle that last question first. So absolutely not. I mean, one of the reasons that I started Bioverge was really to democratize access, not just for investors, but really there's all kinds of great technologies that are um, being developed from across the country, right? And oftentimes entrepreneurs are at a disadvantage if they're not located in an ecosystem that has a robust you know, ecosystem of, of investors, right? Silicon Valley or the Boston, you know, Cambridge ecosystem, particularly in healthcare and biotech, right? So there, I mean, there are great technologies that are coming out of, you know, Johns Hopkins, for example, or the Mayo Clinic or, or wherever. Um, and just because those entrepreneurs aren't located in an ecosystem that has a lot of investors, they do, they are disadvantaged to some degree. So we are absolutely looking for those technologies because they're just as good as technologies that are coming out of, you know, places in, in Silicon Valley and, and the Boston ecosystem. So absolutely looking for technology sort of a, a, across across the country. Okay. Um, it, it, and then it, the key, key investment themes? Yeah, key investment themes. I mean, we're, we're pretty broad. Uh, again, we're sort of focused on this idea of the convergence of, of bio and tech. Uh, but within that, you know, that, that's pretty broad. So, you know, we've made some investments in companies that are using artificial intelligence and machine learning and applying it to drug discovery to try to identify new targets for uh, neuroder, neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, so we have one company that, that's using that approach, and including natural language processing, looking for novel targets for Parkinson's disease, for example. Um, again, sort of digital health and digital therapeutics is an area that we're focused on. We do, uh, you know, do, do a fair amount in the, in the regenerative medicine space. So cell and tissue engineering, you know, I, I talked a little bit about the Evi story, which, which was a gene therapy. 
Uh, we have a, an investment now that we're about to close. I can't publicly disclose the name of the company, but you know they're basically taking uh, adipose-derived stem cells, so so fat stem cells, and they can actually differentiate those cells into uh, liver cells. So they're what they call hepatocyte-like cells, and the idea is they can inject those cells into a patient suffering uh, like acute liver failure, for example, and those cells can actually then engraft into the liver and uh, reconstitute the functioning of the liver, which ideally will alleviate the need for a liver transplant in the future. Like, wow, okay, like that, that is a huge unmet medical need. That is a huge market. Again, the idea of, of even turning like a fat cell into a hepatocyte-like cell seems like science fiction, but it's not. That's science fact. That is happening today. This company is doing it. Um, you know, it, 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 there's, there's high scientific risk but there's huge reward at the end of the day um, for these types of things. So, you know, we, we, we do, you know, we at Bioverge, I mean, we are looking to invest in, you know, well, I guess what I would say is, you know, high risk, you know, science and technology innovations, but they have the potential for, you know, massive upside, massive reward. So, um, you know, we look at everything from a risk adjusted return profile, um, and so we're, we're looking for investments that we make that, you know, can return that, you know, that 10 X plus on, on every investment that, that we pursue. Sure. So talk a little bit about the healthcare focus. Uh, we'll look at it from um, kind of the other side, which is uh, boy, that's a narrow focus. Um, is it too narrow and what are the um, risks and um, uh, I guess the overall opportunity and benefits for having that tight of a focus? Yeah, I mean, I would say that the focus is not too narrow. I'd say the, fo the focus is actually our, our edge, right? I mean, we, we are healthcare domain experts. We are healthcare specialists. That's what allows us to, number one, identify the most compelling investment opportunities and in companies out there. Uh, but number two, and I think even more importantly, I mean, that's what allows us to get our foot in the door with these, com these companies in these what are often super competitive financing rounds, right? We have a lot of value that we bring to the table and, you know, the sort of the value add is, is what every VC says. But, you know, if we were generalists, we, you know, we wouldn't be able to add a ton of value to the companies that we are investing in. And so I think if you were to go talk to a lot of the founders that we've invested in, they'd say, yeah, you know, the Bioverse check is nice, right? Obviously, we need capital to, to build the business. But, you know, the, the Bioverse network that they have brought to the table has been, you know, as valuable or much more valuable than the check that that Bioverge writes. And so I think that's a point that we're particularly proud of. And so it's it's only by having this domain expertise, this specialized healthcare network that allows us to compete in the space, you know, and get ourselves into these these highly competitive deals. So I think without that, I think we'd actually be at a disadvantage. Um, so it, it, it is very much our, our competitive edge. And then, of course, I mean, we, we talked a little bit about this, but by definition, investing in healthcare is impact investing, right? You know, health is universal. It affects us all. So, you know, we fundamentally believe that everyone should be investing in literally the future of our own health. And so, you know, that's what we offer. You know, we offer, you know, high quality, highly curated investment opportunities, you know, and, and again, I think it's our expertise that allows us to curate these opportunities. It's, it's not a volume game for us. It's a quality game for us. And so when an investor comes to buyers, they can be sure that anything on the platform, well, there's certainly no guarantee of future returns. You know, we've done our homework. We've done our diligence. You know, we've weeded out, you know, you know, nine out of 10 companies before uh, any investor ever sees a company on our platform, for example. Yeah, totally agree with you. That resonates with me. The the fundamental premise for Brimacomb Capital is the same thing. I'm going to add a lot of value to the company. I'm going to utilize all the contacts uh, that I have and the network that I've built over a couple of decades. And so the value add component and being more of an extension of their team versus a checkbook I'm totally, totally with you 100% on that. Yeah. And I think, in, in, you know, I mean, let's be honest, capital is a commodity, right? So what's going to attract, you know, for all the entrepreneurs out there, like you should think seriously about who you let invest in your company and who you have on your cap table, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of capital out there. And so what else are investors bringing to the table beyond, beyond the check? You know, obviously you need capital to, you know, make things work, but there, there's a lot of other value add out there. And I guess there, there's, a, there's a couple avenues we could go, right? I mean, 
So the best venture firms out there have these robust networks. They can sort of connect folks, you know, entrepreneurs and, and help them scale their business. And that's everything from, from hiring to introductions to potential strategic partners, to, you know, helping them build future syndicates for future financing rounds, right? And a lot of the best firms do that. You know, we've taken the page of BioVerge where it's not just me or not just my co-founder, Rick Gibb, who have a network, right? We've built a network of a bunch of other people that we can leverage who all have networks of their own. So we, we re really have embraced this network model. So it's not just, you know, me and Rick knowing a, a bunch of people, it's us plus the entire BioVerge network that we can call on. And so, you know, whether someone needs advice on the regulatory front or CMC or manufacturing or whatever it may be, you know, maybe I don't directly know that person, but I can get in touch with that person in one or two phone calls. And so like, that's the power of this network model that we've embraced. Right. Um, the other thing that I'll, I'll just touch on, circling back to the reg CF model is, you know, if you, if you think about the power of the crowd, right, you can go to a VC firm and you have that, that firm and that partner basically invest in you and, and you have, you know, whoever they know, but if you're going out and you're doing a regulation crowdfunding offering and you're getting hundreds or maybe thousands of individual investors, they each have their own network, right? They each could be value add investors in their own right. And so you can sort of amplify, I think, a lot of um, what can be done in terms of uh, building and scaling your network by going down the rate CF path. And we've actually seen that play out sort of in, in miniature with Bioverse, right? Because we our model is aggregating individual accredited investors, at least historically that has been. And each of those investors have actually oftentimes provided a lot of value to our portfolio companies. So maybe it's not, you know, Neil or Rick or, or, or Bioverge, it's an investor that we brought to the table who, been, who has invested in the company through us and they have some expertise and they've helped the portfolio company. So I think that can be amplified through the break CF route as well. Sure. So you got a couple of different ways you're looking at companies. You're looking at them from an investment standpoint. You're looking at them uh, by going onto the uh, reg CF platform. Uh, we had a question that came in from Rob. Thanks, Rob. Rob's a longtime listener and participant. Appreciate your support. Um, what do you look for in leadership team of a potential investment? I know assessing leadership, everybody always says, oh, we want to invest in uh, high end, high quality uh, leadership teams, but to try to define that is a little more challenging. So how do you assess leadership teams? Yeah, I think it's, it's a great question, Rob. Uh, you know, it's definitely more art than science. Right. I mean, obviously, what one way to do it and, and one way that a lot of folks do it is, you know, track record. You know, are they are they serial entrepreneurs? Do they have a, you know, a, a history of exits under their belt? That's great. But that's a very, very narrow focus. And that leaves out a whole bunch of, I think, very promising entrepreneurs. So, you know, that's one easy box to check. But, you know, we invest in a lot of you know relatively young founders where they're founding their first company. Um, and I think that that's really critical. So one of the biggest things that we look for is, is clearly passion. Right. And so. We often take the, the point of view that passion is the biggest predictor of success. And so, you know, j just to get more granular, you know, if we're looking and making an investment in entrepreneur, entrepreneur A is, is clearly very passionate and very mission driven, you know, entrepreneur B maybe isn't quite so mission driven or isn't quite so passionate. We're going to invest in, in, in entrepreneur A 10 out of 10 times. Because, you know, if you're passionate about something, right, you're going to spend more of your time, you know, diving in, reading about that, you know, spending more of, of, of your time trying to build the company, make that happen, right? You don't really think of it as, as work as much because it is something you're so passionate about. And so you're going to have a competitive advantage over that entrepreneur who maybe isn't so passionate. Um, so that's why we feel like passion is the biggest predictor of success. You know, that, that said, right, I mean, we want to look for, uh, a, you know, a team that does have a d diverse skill set, right? Um, you know, for the CEO and, and founder in general, right? I mean, a lot of what you're doing is, is not just technical in nature. You know, we invest in a lot of technical founders, right? A lot of scientists, um, but they have to be able to tell their story, right? I mean, part of being a CEO, part of being a founder is a sales job. Right. And so you have to be able to articulate and tell the story about what your what your company, what your science is doing. And, and we see a lot of, uh, you know, scientists turn entrepreneurs who get lost in the weeds and can't can't sort of translate their science into layperson terms that other people can understand and get behind. 
right? So for us looking for that rare quality of someone who is both technical, but also has the wherewithal to craft that narrative and tell the story to go out and raise capital, right? Because that's going to be critical is, is, is really what we're looking for. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the same person, right? That can be a, a team, right? So you can, you can merge skill sets to make that happen, but that's got to be there in the team to, 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 to some extent. Yeah, I would um, I'd add to your list uh, grit. Um, things never go exactly as planned. And so you have to be able to fight through challenges and, and disruptions and so forth. But then on your second point there about telling the story, uh, 100% on that one as well. And uh, there's kind of two extremes when people communicate their story. They're either making that audience get excited and comfortable with their ability to execute or the audience gets uneasy, doesn't believe them, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a positive end of the spectrum and a negative one. And a lot of those technical founders, and you touched on it, just unfortunately are not particularly good uh, communicators. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. And so actually a lot of what we try to do at Bioverse is, is right. I mean, we, 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 we try to help founders communicate their story right, and communicate the narrative. Why does this matter? What is your technology? Who is your technology helping, right? And so we we very, because we do invest in healthcare, right? The, the patient is the end user. So how is this impacting patients at the end of the day and sort of work backwards from there and don't get lost in all the technical minutia. That stuff's important, but you don't necessarily need to communicate all of that, right? It's kind of the curse of knowledge. Um, you don't want to get lost in there. And, and Rick, to your point, yes, you know, grit, it's, it's like, it's, I mean, I guess I would define grit as a combination of passion and perseverance, right? And, and you know, one of my favorite books is, is Grit by Angela Duckworth, right? So it talks a lot about that. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's critical. And, you know, I forget the stat, but it's like, you know, what separates successful entrepreneurs from, from the rest? And it, it comes down to perseverance for the most part. I mean, yeah, yeah there's luck in, involved in, in all of these things. But like, can you hang in there long enough to, you know, you know, let your idea become successful, right? And yep. and a lot of times people quit for a variety of reasons and, and there's a lot of good reasons to quit. Um, but if you can hang in there, a lot of what separates out the successful entrepreneurs from others is, is just that just that idea of, of grit and perseverance. Yeah, so let's, um, let's change gears a little bit. Uh, talk about investing at a high level. So you're doing early stage life sciences, go up a level from there's venture capital go up a letter from a uh, level from there and it's alternative assets. Talk a little bit about why you think alternative assets are such an important part to building a well diversified portfolio. Yeah, I, th I think they're, I think they're, it's, it's critical. And I, I think you have to look no further than, you know, some of the most sophisticated investors in the world, right? Some of the institutional investors, endowment funds, right? They have validated that in that alternative assets complement and make a well diversified portfolio. And let's just look at Yale, for example, right? Yale is one of the largest and best performing endowments out there. I think they have like a 12.6, you know, annual return over the last like 30 years, right? If you look at their portfolio, 50% of their portfolio is allocated to alternative assets. You know, some portion of that is in private equity, some portion of that is in venture capital. Um, now that mix is not going to be right for the individual investor, right? Institutional investors have a very different risk profile, but they validated based on their returns over a very long period of time that alternative assets can serve to enhance a portfolio's returns while also reducing the risk of the portfolio. So as you think about reducing this to the level of an individual investor, and I'll just use myself as a case study, right? I thought I had a well-diversified portfolio, but my portfolio was well-diversified in public equities and bonds. Great, but guess what happens when there's a financial crisis or something? They all go and they move in lockstep and they all go down, right? So I was well diversified with a global portfolio of public equities and bonds, but I was missing all a whole other asset class of alternative assets, which are largely uncorrelated with the public markets. They can and they can enhance your uh, return potential for your for your portfolio. They can reduce the overall volatility of your portfolio. Uh, and, and again, I think the large institutional investors have, have validated that. So then the idea is, well, how do you, as an individual, how do you access and how do you build a diversified portfolio that includes some amount of alternative assets and what should that amount be? Well, that amount is, is, is really sort of a, a, you know, a personal choice based on risk tolerance, but, you know, investing in alternative assets, right, you need to invest what I would call patient capital. So it's capital that you have 
uh, that you can sit, you know, set aside for the long term. You don't need to access to buy a home in the next couple of years, right? It's going to be locked up. It's going to be a liquid, which also I would say could be a benefit, right? I mean, oftentimes investors are our own, our own worst enemy, right? We will often sell our winners too early and hold our losers too long. So by investing in illiquid assets, you're sort of forced to hold on to your winners until they bear fruit because you can't get out, right? So I, I think there, there is some benefit there. Um, so, you know, whether you want to invest, I don't know, two, five, 10% of your you know, assets in alternative assets, you know, that's, that's a personal decision. Um, but then even within the asset class, I think it's really critical to think about how do you even build a diversified portfolio within that asset class. And so at BioVerge, uh, you know, I'll just give an example. What we offer are we allow people to make individual investments in specific companies and build a portfolio that way. So, you know, don't come to BioVerge and invest in one company and, you know, hope for the best. You really want to build a diversified portfolio and give yourself a statistical probability of success. Or we offer what we call the BioVerge Access Fund, which allows investors to, add, to invest in basically a, a mini VC fund, and that builds a portfolio of you know, 10 to 15 companies. So investors don't have to do the work themselves. But you know, as, as I think most of us probably don't, right? V, the, the VC world in particular operates under what's known as the power laws, right? So if you're investing in a portfolio of you know, 10, like 10 or 20 companies, let's just say 10 companies, right? There's going to be a handful of those companies that you know, full out fail and you get no capital back. There will be some companies where you return some portion of your capital, maybe, you know, maybe up to one X, maybe a fraction of your capital, maybe one to two X, um, you know, and there'll be maybe one or two that you get like a two or three X. And then there's going to be maybe one, maybe two that return your entire portfolio and make up for all of the losses in your portfolio. So you need to invest in enough companies to give yourself that statistical probability of success, not just invest in one company. Um, so I, I think I think that's critical, um, and so I think a lot of what we do at BioVerge is, is just, just tr to try to help educate people about the asset class, about the benefits, and about the risks, and about how to build a smart, well diversified portfolio, even within the asset class. Yep, and you brought up uh, earlier impact investing. Talk a little bit about uh, the notion of impact investing, how that plays into your strategy and impact investing uh, versus investing strictly for financial returns. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, Rick, this is, this is, this is a great point. So uh, again, so health is universal, right? So by definition, investing in the healthcare space is, in my mind, impact investing. Um, so the other, the other notion that sort of bothers me is differentiating you know, imp, you know, impact investing or socially responsible investing from investing strictly for ROI. I do not believe they're mutually exclu exclusive, right? I mean, they, they are uh, and should be thought about as one in the same. You don't need to sacrifice returns to invest in things that have a societal benefit or that can impact all of us. Um, so, I mean, that's that's the path that we've taken at, 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 at BioVerge. And, and so, you know, I think there's, um, you know, in this day and age, there's a lot of ways to, you know, invest in, you know, socially responsible, uh, investments, uh, ESG investing is, I think, you know, one of the buzzwords out there these days. And then it's everything from society to, you know, healthcare is our particular focus. But, you know, th these companies, um, I think, actually by having a, a sort of a, a, a social impact, actually set, them, set, set themselves up for longer term profitability and can often be much more successful because they are investing more, respons more responsibly. Their technologies have a much broader impact. Um, and so I think the notion of you know, ROI or impact is, is, is just not the right way to think about these things. Um, and the, you know, the other thing that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about is you know, and, and this bothers me as well. We, you know, when I when I approach you know certain certain folks, you know, they say, okay, I have a certain you know certain allocation that I think about investing in philanthropic or charitable aspects, and then I have this stuff that I want to like actually invest, and they're very separate buckets, right? And I say, okay, that's great, and you know, please don't stop donating to charity. That's obviously you know well well worthwhile, and we should all all do that. But you don't need to think about them as entirely distinct and separate, right? So I'll just give you an example, right? If you're investing in a, a, a cancer-focused charity, for example, or a charity focused on neurodegenerative diseases, right? Why shouldn't you also think about investing some portion of your assets in startups that are focused on developing treatments for cancer or neurodegenerative diseases? Because guess what? Those technologies are never going to be commercialized without a company involved, right? If you, if you I'll just, let's just take the pharma industry, for example. 
right? There has never been a drug that has been commercialized and reached patients that has not involved the pharmaceutical or biotech company, right? Nonprofits don't do that. That's not their mandate. So like, what, like why not invest some capital in, in early stage companies that are also tackling diseases or areas that you care about? And it's not mutually exclusive with how you think about your know, charitable or philanthropic donations. Lots of good stuff there, and I'm with you, and uh, tried to build our portfolio at Brimacomb Capital uh, similarly. Uh, you brought up the new regulation crowdfunding rules, so let's backtrack to that just a little bit. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you're thinking uh, on the JOBS Act, these crowd, new crowdfunding rules, and the impact of some of uh, this on companies trying to raise capital. Yeah, so I think this is really, I mean, I think we're at a really innovative time um, in the sort of the, the early stage financing ecosystem, right? So I think gone are the days where entrepreneurs had to rely on capital from VCs, right? Um, th there's just, there's not enough capital to go around. I mean, if you, if you look at the diversity of entrepreneurs, you know, VCs have invested in, it's not very diverse, uh, subset of entrepreneurs, right? So there's a lot of uh, folks that have lacked access to, uh, you know, getting capital from VC. So I think, you know, regulation crowdfunding does a number of things. I mean, number one, it now has created a viable pathway to raise, raise initial capital from friends, uh, from family uh, in, in a streamlined fashion. So, so that's one. Number two, with the new rules that just went into effect on Monday where companies can raise now up to $5 million, that's a significant amount of capital, right? That could actually be a series A round of financing, right? So companies may not ever actually have to go the VC route. So you could, act, you, you could go and you could go out and raise a reg CF round of up to $5 million. And that's in any given year. So you could do that in multiple years and access the capital markets that way. Uh, there are also new rules around how much can be raised under regulation A um, uh, uh, offerings as well. And so it used to be $50 million, that's now increased to $75 million. And so if you, if you think about a financing trajectory, right, you could do an early you know, friends and family round, do a rake CF, you raise a couple hundred thousand, maybe a, a million, a couple of million, you could go back, you could do that again under rake CF. And then if you need a large amount of capital, you could go do a reg A plus offering um, and raise up to $75 million, right, and never even need to access the, the VC route. So I don't think it's mutually exclusive. I think we'll, we'll actually see, um, uh, you know, some of the some of the best companies actually play in, in both arenas, right? And I, I don't think that you know, Reg CF raises or Reg A plus raises will create an overhang to make your company less attractive to VCs. I mean, there, there's there's a lot of ways to keep investors, at, you know, as one entity on the cap table, so you don't have a messy cap table and, and things like that. You can now roll investors into an SPV, for example. Um, so. I, you know, again, not mutually exclusive. I think there's a lot of scenarios where, you, you know, VCs and Rake CF um, raises coexist together. The other, the other thing I'll say is, you know, Rake CF raises allow people to get their communities involved, right? And so let's, let's just take a, a company that's tack, tackling uh, epilepsy, for example, right? You know, they, they could actually now go out via a Reg CF raise and they could go and they could galvanize and allow the epilepsy community to invest in the technology. Right, and and that has never previously been possible. Um, but because of some of the new regulations under the Jobs Act, right, I think that's really critical. And so you you can have you know built in support from uh, a community going down this this Reg CF pathway that was never previously uh, accessible. And so you know I think it's I think that's that's really powerful, and I think that's really important. So you touched on uh, the power of the network. Um, for yourself and for BioVerge. Um, and I view that as a critical part of my business as well. That's actually how we met. We met through an angel uh, investment group uh, focused on life science companies. Um, not that I want you to spend tons of time here because I got a couple more questions, but uh, we've been now working together for a couple of months, uh, having met each other um, late last year. What are some of the key learnings and maybe it's just one uh, but what are some of the learnings that you've taken from our interactions? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there, I think there, there's a lot, and and um, yeah, Rick, I mean, I think we we met as an Angel Capital Association meeting um, that that we're we're members of. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think a lot of what separates successful uh, companies, successful entrepreneurs, is is translating the vision 
uh, into something that you can execute against. And I think what I've taken away from our interactions is that is that translation phase, right? So we have a vision, but how do you break that down into small steps that you can execute against? Um, and what are those incremental sort of you know, KPIs are points that you can measure to make sure that you're making progress towards that ultimate goal, right? So if your ultimate goal is, you know, launching product XYZ, how do you break that down into sort of like, you know, sub steps, sub, sub, sub steps, or like many sort of incremental steps to hit that ultimate goal? Um, and I think, and I think that's really critical. And so you know, like, again, the devil's in the details. So there's a lot of people out there that have great ideas and brilliant visions that never build, you know, real businesses because they can't translate that and they can't execute. So to me, I think a lot of the value that I've derived in our interactions is, 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 is translating that into something that's, that you can execute against. Great. Well, um, that's uh, good for me to hear. So thanks for sharing that. <laughs> Um, so interesting um, education journey for you, career arc, uh, starting with virus hunting and reading and, and seeing movies and, and TV shows uh, back in high school and starting there and, and all the different things that you've done over, uh, again, your education and your career. As you look back, is there something that you learned that you wish you would have learned sooner? Oh, gosh. Yeah, I think there's probably a lot of things. Um, you know, what, one thing that I think is, is critical, and actually I'll, I'll just tie this to the, the, the title of the talk today, right? The best investment you'll ever make will be believing in yourself, right? I think that that's really critical. And this notion, which I think is very prevalent in the Silicon Valley ecosystem, but is not so prevalent elsewhere in the country, is this idea of failure uh, and, and not being afraid to fail, right? I mean, I think we've totally embraced this idea of a growth mindset. And the, the only failure is not ever trying, right? Otherwise, everything else is just a learning opportunity. And so I, you know, I've had some successes in my career. I've had way more failures than I've had successes, right? And so every time you, you quote unquote fail, it's not a failure, right? So it's a shift in the mindset to say, oh, that's just a learning experience. I learned maybe how not to do something or I learned something maybe I wasn't so good at. Um, and I, I always think back to Thomas Edison's famous, famous quote, right? Before he invented the light bulb, he's like, well, I learned a thousand ways not to invent the light bulb. Um, and then finally he figured out how to do it, right? So I, I think that's really critical. So as, as people are thinking about their career path or thinking about, you know, taking risk, uh, you, you can, you know, you can fail going down what you believe is a, is a safe career path, right? You can get fired from a job. There's all these things that are out of your control that can happen uh, going down what you think is a, is a safer path. So, you know, why not take a risk and try to do something you really want to do? Because there's a risk in failure in everything you do. And so, it's like, to me, just having the, the confidence and believing in yourself really is the best investment you'll ever make. Um, and not being afraid to take that risk and fail because there is no failure. The only failure is not trying. Well, that by itself might be our message for our talk. Um, but as you kind of think back over all the different things that you've stated here today and different topics that, that we've gotten into, is there one key takeaway that you'd like the audience to bring with them? Yeah, I mean, I think there, there's a number of takeaways. I mean, I, I think th th this idea of sort of like passion and, and perseverance, right? Grit, I think if you're an operator and you're an entrepreneur, I think it's, it's really critical. I think if you're an investor, I think this notion of you know at least looking into including alternative assets in your portfolio, I think makes a lot of sense. Uh, I would also say this notion of you know impact investing and not being mutually exclusive with generating financial returns, I think is, is really critical. So I think we need to reframe uh, that. And I think we're starting to see that. I mean, if you look at like Larry Fink and BlackRock, I mean, they've launched a lot of you know financial products around more socially responsible investing. So you know that that theme is here today. That that's pretty pervasive. So, you know, as you think about investing, right, I guess the one theme that I'll leave you with is capital drives change. Right. So where you put your money will help drive change in this world. So think very hard about that, because you as an investor have a tremendous amount of power and you can basically vote with your dollars where you want to see change in this world. I love it. I love it. Neil, um, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, how can they uh, find you? Yeah, so folks can, can go to our website, www.buyerverse.com, uh, learn more about you know, what we're up to. People can reach out to me on a personal basis, neil at buyerverse.com. 
uh, feel free to reach out to me and connect on LinkedIn as well. Always happy to, always happy to chat. And Neil is N-E-I-L. That's correct. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm going to have you back uh, later so that we can get an update on some of these companies that you're working on and the progress you're making. Look forward to uh, hearing about the uh, Reg CF platform and all the progress that, that you're going to be doing there. So again, thank you for your time today. And we look forward to having you back again soon. Thanks, Rick. This was a great discussion. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.